Investing in personalizing the web hasn't yet really paid a dividend. Right? So users don't really make those big investments themselves. They don't. So we have this killer service called My Yahoo. Right? We have 300 million people that log into Yahoo, 300 million. Only 9% of those folks construct a My Yahoo page. Why? Because they won't put the effort into it. From their perspective, you know, spending 15 minutes to curate content on their own isn't worth the effort. They don't like building the, their own pages. They like to suggest and save. Tell me what you think I might like. Build it for me. Let me just choose it and say, yeah, I'm ready to go. You know, people are investing in their experience on the internet. They're investing you know, literally in aggregate petabytes of data. We have a back end that is the grid that services all the, all the services that we, we provide at Yahoo. Petabytes of data go through that thing on a daily basis. Billions of transactions on a daily basis. We serve three million imp different types of impressions on the homepage just trying to infer what people want because we know that they won't curate it themselves. Right? Now, from an advertiser perspective, we follow users as an industry. We follow users across the web. We try to tailor, we cookie them, and we watch them go across the web. And yet, we don't do the same thing for their consumer experience. Right? It's, you have the website experience here, a website experience here, and we don't connect the things together. Now, everybody knows the web uh, isn't free. You know that there's, a, there's, an in, there's sort of a relationship between advertisers and consumers. And we're all aware of it. My 81-year-old you know, mother is aware that there's a relationship between an advertiser and consumer, and that's why she has free email, because it's not exactly free. But she would like the data that's being collected that gives her as closely targeted ads as possible to make the consumer experience more targeted as well. Second, connected devices. I have two kids. You saw them, 13 and 16. They type on glass more than they type on keyboards. They're going to say 10 years from now, remember those clickety-clackety keyboards we used to work on? Oh, those things were so funny. Right? The only time they use them is when they have a term paper. Everything else they do is one-handed or two-handed typing. So there's a lot of folks in the world today that are on feature phones. Right? If you actually leave the United States, you go down to Asia, most of the folks that are in Asia are doing this on feature phones. And when they graduate, they're going to go to smartphones and they're never going to have a tethered experience. First of all, in a lot of those places, there isn't tethered infrastructure, so they can't use it. And the only place there's a tethered PC is at some internet cafe where they got to wait in line for 20 people to use it. So that device, that mobile device, is unbelievable and very important. Now, all of these things I described really don't do a good job targeting me. And I'll use an example of something that does a really good job, really good job personalizing and making my experience across devices great. Kind of a weird example. The Kindle. How many people have a Kindle here? A few of you. Not that many devices out there. The service is what's amazing. So if you think about it, there's a Kindle app for Droid. There's a Kindle app for iPhone. There's a Kindle app for iPad. There's a Kindle app for Kindle, of course. And I finish a book, or I'm in page 22, and I go to another service. I go to another device, and I'm reading the same book. I'm on the same page. That's what people want to do. They want to go across all these different devices and have the experience that they want, when they want it, where they want it. And you know, honestly, I want to Kindleize my life. Wouldn't you like that, to have the cloud, somebody's cloud, know enough about you to Kindleize my photos, Kindleize my contacts? Anybody gone to a Verizon store and actually tried to uh, you know, take something off your droid and move it over to a Blackberry? An hour and a half later, you're just frustrated, and maybe some of that data actually moved for you. Right? It ought to just be in a cloud, and it ought to be able to transform across these different things. I'd like to kindleize my house. I'd like to kindleize my hotel room. It knows I like the fan on when I'm sleeping, and it knows I like it at 68 degrees. That is something that ought to be happening in the cloud. You know me, Mr. Service Provider, so treat me like me. Now, since vacation, devices got a lot smarter. And GPS silicon got a lot cheaper. So GPS silicon, sans the battery issue, has got to be one of the most kind of life-changing experiences, because now everything has the capability of knowing where you are. Almost every device you carry, 
for very little cost. Geotagging generally today isn't used for a whole lot of things that are valuable. You know, there's the, the percentage of photos that are geotagged on Flickr is pretty phenomenal. Lots of people are doing photos, and you know, you can find out what time your bus is going to arrive. But there's not a lot of personal experiences that are based on where I am, where I've been, telling me where I was, and now I'm back again, and informing some decisions, both for me as a personal consumer and as a consumer of advertisers. Like hyper local, hyper relevance, tell me where I am. I guess that'd be great for an Alzheimer patient. Just tell me where I am, because I've forgotten. And tell me where my friends have been over the past couple of weeks, couple of years, so I, I know maybe where they prefer to be, and maybe that will be where I should be as well, because they're kind of like me. And keep me in touch with promotional offers that happen to be in the area that I'm in. So let's talk about social for a minute. Between zero and 500, the choice is usually zero. For most of us, if you have the opportunity to publish something to 500 people all at once, or nobody, you'll choose to publish to nobody. My personal experience is after nine, having 997 friends uh, on Facebook, which is generally a very large flat list of people, that I'm petrified about publishing a status update for fear of offending someone. And I thought that this was sort of a, uh, a, an age demographic issue for me. And so I posed it to my kids to say if they had the same problem. My 13-year-old in two weeks went from zero to 250 friends and said, well, I don't have that problem yet. My 16-year-old, who has some 450 or so, said, you know, it's kind of scary. I got in a big fight with Hunter, my best friend, and it was because of something that I posted, and it was about a view that really I never would have shared with him in the first place, but the people I wanted to share with, you know, they saw it. It didn't bother them, but it did bother that friend. Where the world is going to go with social is small groups of people that actually matter to you, right? And remember the thing I said about homepage. Right? If I've got a group of friends that's 997 people deep, am I going to spend the time to curate that list down to just the people that I care about on topics? Uh, no, I'm not. Because I just don't care enough to do it. I'll just, I'll just leave. What I want to have something, I want to have something that will do that for me, that will create those lists of people that I care the most about. You know, relationships and behavior is generally a very complex thing. And if you think about just a party where you go over into a corner and you're talking to five people, having a robust conversation about a particular, let's say, political issue with five like-minded folks and somebody walks in that's not like-minded, what happens to that group of folks? It breaks apart, it separates, the sixth person kind of disappears, and uh, eventually you go over to another corner with those same five people and you resume the conversation. That's just the way it models. Nobody's doing that on the web today, and it's something that is just a gaping opportunity for companies that have communications, media, content, et cetera. So, you know, the future's all upside. You know, our jobs as technologists is to make all this stuff uh, easy. And assailing, you know, my business, um, we haven't done that yet. We haven't made it intuitive. You know, social's still a site. We're not targeting as well as we can. We're not making experiences uniquely personal and following across these different devices, but we are getting there, right? We haven't gotten out of the rectangle yet. We're still filling a space. We haven't done enough around the canvas. You're going to see some things, and maybe have this morning already, that show that canvas is changing. But it's not yet personal. And, you know, the canvas is a very important thing. It's not the thing. It's what do you know about me? What do you know about my context? What do you want to offer me at that particular moment in time, in that location, on this device, because that's who I am right now. 